Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're so happy to have you with us here this morning. The call to worship is from Matthew, and it is chapter 6, 33 to 34, and it says this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So we just pray as we start our worship and we spend this time together as a church family that we put all of our worries and all of our fears and all of our troubles at the feet of Jesus this morning. You live among the least of these, the weary and the weak. And it
into the
Hey, good morning, church family. It is so good to have you here with us. I want to affirm uh, that we welcome people here on site. We've got the multi-purpose room uh, being used uh, for a gathering. Uh, people are in there uh, worshiping and they're doing it safely with masks and social distancing. It's a great place to come back to the building uh, for us to worship together. We also want to affirm our friends who are still at home. Uh, we care for you as well. And we just love that you are worshiping with us, whether you're here on site or you're at home in your living room. Thank you for being a crucial part of our FBC family. Uh, we are praying for you. You are loved. Uh, speaking of praying for you, uh, we have uh, friendship folders that are a great tool for us as staff to know how we can pray for you. Please fill those out. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know that you're here uh, participating with us and that uh, how we can be praying for you. Also, you might notice that uh, there are some books behind me. I am here in the church library. How exciting is that? The library is open. Yes, we can, we can do this. There are safe ways that we can do this to reopen. And so we're in the church library. It's going to be available to you on Tuesdays every week. Uh, a great resource for parents and for kids. We love our young families here. Speaking of young families, we also have a fun event happening on October 31st in the afternoon called Trunk or Treat. There are going to be some uh, volunteers on site here with their trunks decorated and in costume uh, to cheer our families on as they drive through and pick up a prize for completing a citywide scavenger hunt. So families, be on the lookout for more information there. Uh, we would love for you to participate and, and just have this fun event. Uh, together. Also, uh, our phone ministry is such a vital piece of our church family staying connected right now. In this time, that's so important. Uh, I spent uh, over two hours yesterday talking to our young families, praying with them, asking them how they're doing, uh, what their needs were. And I, I tell you, I had some great long conversations with them. Uh, it's so important to just pick up the phone. We need that right now in our church family. And if you're hoping for more connection, maybe you can be on the, the sending side of the phone, that you could be the one picking up the phone to call other people to care for them. Our phone ministry needs help in that way. So please uh, pick up the phone. Let us know uh, that you are willing to, to volunteer in that way. Uh, a couple more things for young families. If you didn't know, young families, we have kids' time at home material resources for you. Uh, a few weeks ago, our Kids Time team put together a whole month's worth of lessons, and then they went around to our young families and dropped off a package, got to say hi, got to check in, and also give families resources to be doing Kids Time lessons with their kids. Uh, so that is happening. That's available to you. We're going right now through the Fruits of the Spirit, and soon we'll be doing the Armor of God. Uh, some exciting things are happening there. Uh, also, we not only care about kids, we not only care about youth, but we care about our parents as well. Uh, in November, save the date, parents, for November 20th and 21st. It's a Friday night and a Saturday night. The church is providing for you uh, a conference that you can participate in either online or you can participate in the multi-purpose room with a small group of people. Uh, it's, it's, like I said, called Equip. 2020. The whole idea is that we want to equip parents so that they can have the tools to safeguard their kids against very dangerous things. We want to guard the minds of our children. Uh, the, the content's kind of PG-13, so I won't really go into it here, but be looking for that information. Uh, it's so vital that we, we battle for the minds of our kids. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that our, our church is going through a season of prayer. Pastor Paul last week started a, um, a series on Nehemiah. Uh, we, he started in chapter 1, and it was all about starting with prayer, going to God on our knees uh, for our nation, for our family, for, for our lives. And so right now, uh, we are starting. We are going into a 40 days of prayer. We're calling it Praying Through. We want to invite you to help us pray through this season that we want to go to God together in prayer, on our knees. Will you commit with us to go to God on your knees for your families, for your church, for yourself? Commit with us 
More information is coming on that soon. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you and a privilege, as always, to be able to spend this time in God's Word. And I'm going to begin by reading God's Word and our passage for this morning before we take a moment to pray and then dive right in to see what God has for us this morning. It says this in Exodus and chapter 34, and I'm going to read from verse 27 and following. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Hopefully it's close enough to whatever version you uh, have chosen to read from that you can follow along with me. It says this, again, Exodus 34, starting in verse 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. It came about that when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, he and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him. And Moses spoke to them, after all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would, would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Let's pause, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive right in this morning. God, thank you. Thank you again that we can meet together. And once again, while physically separated, we know that we can be spiritually united and close. Thank you that you are a God who breaks borders, who acts beyond distance of all kinds, 
A God who says, where two or three are gathered, I am there. And we know today, Lord, that you are here, that you are present, that you are with us. And that today your desire is that you might change us, shape us, make us, and mold us into your very likeness. I just pray, Lord, that today, again, by your grace and your mercy, we would allow you to speak to our hearts, that you would put your finger upon each and every one of us, that you might highlight some of those areas where we know you as Lord of our lives, and yet perhaps today have yet to bow the knee or walk in a way that you desire us to so walk. Lord, I pray this morning that anything that is not of you would just go in one ear and out the other, but that anything from you would go deep, would stick to our hearts and our minds, would not leave us, would plant seeds that would grow the fruit of righteousness that you long for us to have. Thank you for this opportunity to look at your word, and I pray not only be encouraged by who you are, but challenged in who you desire to make us to be. Thank you for what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, In our reading today, we're looking at Moses and a veiling of the glory. And as we do, I want to highlight that God often speaks to me in such a way that he's growing, he's taking me somewhere. And as I look back to perhaps where we've been in these uh, Sundays past, as I've had the privilege to be with you, um, we started by looking in the book of Exodus, that God had called his people to be a people of purpose. They were being called to be a kingdom of priests. And that purpose was not going to be found by their ability to produce something or perform something for God. It had its roots in God's presence with them and what he was making them to be. We went on, and last Sunday I was with you, we looked at the life of Jacob, a person who longed for the things of God, the blessings of God, but found in his heart and in his mind that the things of God were something he needed to take, to lie, to obtain, and it was up to him to make and shape his life after God rather than receive from God things that had been promised well before. We looked at the fact that when God looked at Jacob, someone's life who you could say was not much better than Esau's, morally speaking, God never never chose the morally perfect. God was always looking for those who are willing to be transformed, changed by God. And we saw God, in fact, meet Jacob, wrestle with Jacob, and bring him to the point and place where he had to admit his name, Jacob, a supplanter, a heel grabber, so that there and then he might transform him into Israel, man who had wrestled with man and God and overcome. And today, as I've been reading further and God has been working on me and my heart, he's been reminding me this week of the many times, though I long for the blessings of God, I take it upon myself to try and make, mold, shape, achieve the things of God rather than receive the blessings from God. And there are times where God needs to wrestle with me, wrestle with my heart, and times where I'm finding that even though I may see the glory of God, I may see my purpose from God. I can take that glory and I can veil the glory. And this morning, I find that I often have a children's storybook view of the Bible or I make assumptions on what I've read and today what I need to do is read a little closer because just as we see Moses veiling the glory of God, there are times in my life when I veil the things that God is doing and accomplishing And sometimes that veil shows up in ways I didn't realize until I allow the Lord to take a moment to wrestle, to grapple, and to put his finger on those places. I want to start this morning, uh, and you may notice that often I have to head to two or three verses before I get to our uh, passage that we're looking at together. This morning I want to start in 2 Corinthians and chapter 2 and verse 14. Before I read those verses, I want to share something with you, and that is this. 
I grew up as a prairie boy in Manitoba while I lived in town. Um, Many of my relatives were farmers all around us, uh, something I appreciate now being a farmer here on Vancouver Island. I'll never forget a story that uh, one of my aunts and uncles shared with me, and that was this. They had a neighbor uh, or a friend who was also a farmer. This farmer raised hogs for a living. And one day, this gentleman wanted to go away on holiday. And whether he was tired of being a hog farmer, known as a hog farmer, he decided that he was going to buy himself new clothes. He was going to get a new suitcase. He would leave that farm and go on holidays and on the prairies. That was often a tradition. You'd work hard through those summer months, sun up to sundown, and when winter came and snow covered everything, you'd take time to go away. Well, he went away, and he had left his clothes behind, his occupation behind. He had put on his new clothes, and he went away. And whether it was Hawaii or some other hot destination, one day... After arriving, and no one would have known any better, he actually went in and, and, and got into a sauna in, in the hotel he was staying at. Sure enough, it was not soon after he had gone into the sauna that something dramatic happened, and in many ways, if I understand correctly, he cleared the pool area of the local hotel. Why? because the smell of hogs began to come out of his pores as he sat in that sauna. In fact, being a farmer and having raised hogs, I'll tell you this, there's something unique and special about pig poop. It goes into your pores, and it, even if you want to try and use diesel fuel, it, it is something that is hard to get rid of. Well, as this man sat in the sauna that day, no matter what he could have told people about what he did, where he lived, who he lived with, or what occupation he had, no matter how many new clothes he had bought, as he sat in that room and the heat was turned up, everything he was and everything he did began to come out of his pores that day, and the smell filled the whole room. This brings me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want you to hear this in verse 14. But thanks be to God, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Now, don't get me wrong this morning. In no way am I equating the scent of the Holy Spirit uh, to the scent of hogs and a man in a sauna that perhaps shouldn't have been there that moment. What I want to say is this, that today, when we are a people of purpose, God has called us to be those whose lives give off an aroma. They give off a scent and that scent will be given off, and I love how Paul puts it. He says, God is giving off a scent in your life, and he's manifesting through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ. And he, he goes on, he says this, verse 16, who is adequate for these things? There is an unmistakable stench to that of the pig farmer. And I know that because, again, I've told you how many times as a farmer I've probably defiled many a church carpet as I've walked in and had the privilege to speak each time. But as Paul writes, he says, listen, there is an aroma that is being given off from our lives and there is no one adequate to produce these things. That aroma is beyond our ability. And as we read this morning, notice this, that when we give off the fragrance of Christ, our role, our purpose is to be the bearers of the fragrance. 
It's God's purpose. It's in his realm in what people do with it when they catch a whiff of God in our lives. Now, to some, it says, it says we are a fragrant of Christ, both to those being saved and to those perishing. To those who are being saved, it is an aroma from life to life. And to those, it says, death to death who are rejecting God. Today, God's calling you to allow the aroma of Christ to be seen in you. And to those that long and want the things of God, it is going to be a soothing aroma that draws them in. But to those who are running from God, who are doing their own thing before God, who are preferring their own ways before God ways, it will become a stench to them. They will be repulsed by it. And that is not something that we should feel rejected by because they're rejecting Christ, not us. How does this tie in this morning to Exodus and chapter uh, 34? Well, Moses was not only the bearer of the aroma of God's word, he was the bearer and the messenger of God's word itself. And I want to remind you that as we open the word today, in Exodus 34 and verse 27, Moses was coming down the mountain for the second time. Moses was coming down the mountain after which he had gone up for 40 days and 40 nights and had fasted there. While God again gave him the words which were on the previous tablets of stone that had been smashed when he came down and found the people of Israel worshiping a calf made of gold by their own devices, and Aaron's engraving tool. Now when Moses came uh, down that second time, he was about to give the people the word, and they found that his face was glowing. Here's a beautiful moment. Moses didn't even know it. This glowing was not something that you could just put on. In fact, as we just read those words of Paul in 2 Corinthians, you could say it was a glow that none were adequate to produce or reproduce. Moses was bearing not only the words of God, but the glory of the God that came with them. Such a glory it was that when the people saw it, including Aaron, they ran away before he would call them back to himself. Now, as Moses, and, and this is the incredible work of God and how God works despite us. Moses had already been on a mountain fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He came down. He broke the tablets. He disciplined the people. He went back up, and another 40 days and 40 nights he would fast. And if you can think of what someone's face would look like after a second extended fast of no bread and no water, you think of someone's face that would be shallow, that would seem weak, that would seem dull. And yet, after having spent time with the Lord, he was bright with a radiance beyond explanation of anything else than God himself. As we look to be the people of God, this kingdom of priests that God has called, that's where we find our adequacy. That's where we find our equipping is when we stand in the presence of God and absorb the glory. The glory that emanates. The glory that is far greater than we could ever ask or imagine. I find too often in my life, I tend to say words like, give God the glory, and I treat it like something I can muster up, put in a wheelbarrow, wheel over, and dump at his feet. Give him the glory. No, God's glory is unmistakable, and it cannot be produced by man's activity. Again, just as we looked in the life of Jacob, the blessings of God are a gift meant to be received, not something that can be achieved. But this morning, as Moses came down the mountain, and this is where I often look and perhaps get a vision in my mind of something that, that isn't quite there when you read the detail. It tells us, and let me go back to Exodus in chapter uh, 
34, and I'm going to read verse 30. When Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near. Moses called to them, and Aaron and the rulers in the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near. He commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. You see, I always pictured that Moses came down the mountain and when the people were afraid and ran, Moses veiled his face so that they would not be afraid. But that is not what happened. The truth is, Moses came down the mountain, he gave the people everything that he had for them to give. And when doing so, it was only after he spoke. It was only after that he would then go and reveil the face. Because he wasn't veiling the glory, that was going to be evident while he spoke. No, what he was veiling, in fact, was this, that the glory faded after he spoke. It goes on and says this, again, reminding us of that very thing. Verse 33, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face, but whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So whenever he went in with God, veil up, he'd absorb the glory, he'd go out, he'd speak the words, they'd see the glory, and after finishing the talk, the sons of Israel, verse 35, would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, so Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Moses was veiling the fact that the glory was fading. I do this often when I'm uh, doing my things in daily life. I try to veil things I don't want people to know. I'll tell you this, when I became a farmer, having come out of years of ministry, um, farming was a very good thing for me in my strength workout. When you're throwing 50 pound hay bales around every day, you you get physically strong. Here's what it didn't do well for, my, my cardiovascular system, anything and any time that I had in life where I was a a, a deliberate runner, all fell by the wayside. Because when you're chasing cows every day, you're too tired to run at the end of the day. Well, lately I've been trying to get back into that realm of running for my own health, both mentally and physically. It's it's something that helps me immensely. But I found this, and I'm going to be honest with you this morning, as long as None of you will be honest with any of my neighbors if you come up to the Qualicum Beach area because this is the truth, is that I'll go out and I will run a 5K and I'll be jogging and I'll have times when I need to stop and start walking. And there's no shame in walking. You can get some great apps called Couch to 5K that actually time you and you walk a bit and you run a bit and you walk a bit and you run a bit. But there'll be times when I'm running along and I'll say, I am just too tired. And I give in and I stop. But you know what's funny? I will hear a car coming around the corner and I will instinctively start running again. Or I will get to the point where I'm about to pass one or two of my neighbor's driveways and I know they're often outside. And all of a sudden, with whatever energy lacked, I will all of a sudden pick up the pace and go hog snort rip in that last, you know, 500 meters because I don't want them to see me walking. You know what I'm doing? I'm veiling the fact that my body's getting old. I'm veiling the fact that I'm inadequate or perhaps incapable of running, and they don't even know how far I'm running, but I don't want them to know if I left 30 minutes ago that I've come back defeated. And so I've changed what I do, and 
hypocritically, I'll pretend. That's veiling something. And as much as I do that physically, so that my, my neighbors all think I'm this incredible marathon runner, listen, I do it spiritually all the time. And here's how I do it, and it's what Moses did. Moses was veiling something. He wasn't veiling the glory of God. Here's what he was veiling. The fact that the glory was fading. Paul actually writes about this again in his letter to the Corinthian church. And it's actually in 2 Corinthians and chapter 3. And and I'm going to turn there because in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7, he speaks about this veil and says something very important for us today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7. He says, whereas we just read, who's adequate for these things? Who can make the aroma of Christ? He says this, and I'll read from verse 6 of chapter 3 in 2 Corinthians. Who has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit? For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So now, Paul is going to write about the one who does make us adequate. He goes on and says this in verse 7. If the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses, because of the glory of his face fading as it was, How will the ministry of the Spirit fail even more to be with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, We use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains, unlifted because it is removed in Christ." But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit." How amazing is that? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians that Moses used a veil so that the sons of Israel might not look intently at what was fading away. He didn't want them to see that the glory that was glowing on his face was being lost. And so every time he went in with the Lord, he'd lift the veil, he'd absorb the glory, he'd go out, he'd share the glory, but then he'd veil the fact that the glory left. It tells us this, that their hearts were hardened and a veil remains every time Moses is read. The books of the Old Covenant. Do you know what's veiled? This is what's veiled. The fact that the Old Testament, the old letter, had a fading glory. That's what was veiled. Not that it had glory. Moses didn't veil the glory of the Lord. He was veiling the fact that this wasn't a permanent glory. And I want to challenge you this morning, as God has been challenging me, that today, whenever I put out the message that the glory of God is something that I achieve, I veil the glory of God. Whenever I put across that God is lucky that he has me on his team, 
Because of what I can do for him in his name, the glory I can produce for his purpose, you know what I'm doing? I'm veiling the true glory. God's glory was something that God was producing, something none are adequate for. You know what this is like? Trying to put on the aroma of Christ without Christ. Who's adequate? I'll tell you what, I, I know today that we as a church, and I speak personally, I speak corporately, I speak globally, that we are busy trying to put on perfume, put on an aroma, and I'll say this, that the world has become very good at sniffing out a phony. I can't tell you how many times my heart is saddened when I watch the daily news, as much as it is Canada, uh, even perhaps today much more what's going south of our border, when I see people saying and doing things in the name of our God that I don't think our God has anything to do with whatsoever. I mean, truthfully, you can make the Word of God say whatever you want it to say and defend whatever you want to defend, if you try hard enough. You can find the Ku Klux Klan defending their bigotry and hatred with verses. You can find churches saying and doing things and using verses that have nothing to do with nor support the things that they say they do. We put on <laughs> this fragrance. We try by our performance and our perfection. But it is an aroma that we are incapable to make. It is something that comes from Christ alone and he makes us adequate. And when we begin to try to cover up the fact that our efforts and our glory fades, here's what we do. We veil the real glory. We veil the full glory. Because if I'm unwilling to show you my inadequacy, you'll never truly see the one who makes me adequate. If I don't stop and share with you my weakness, you'll never see the God who's actually my strength. If, if I don't share with you my poverty today, you'll never know the God who is my riches and who has been my supporter and supplier of all my needs. If I don't share with you the cracks in my broken relationships, the difficulty in my marriage, and I've just come off a season where my wife was away and, and, and for several weeks helping family, and I was left alone with farm and kids, and I'll tell you what was highlighted more than anything. <laughs> my poor parenting, that's what was highlighted. If I can't share with you the dysfunction in my own home, You'll never see the one who makes me function. All I'm doing by trying to cover the fact that my efforts, my intentions, and my glory fades is veil the glory of the God who is truly giving. Today, it's by no accident that after we read these very words in 2 Corinthians 3, about the fact that Moses was veiling the fading of the glory. And now, whenever you read the Old Testament, a veil remains. You might think that the do's and don'ts of Christianity still hold glory. That today, this church's glory is based on our wisdom, our control, what we can do, how loud we can sing. And we can reduce it to the translation of the Bible we read, the type of hymnal we sing out of, the tempo of songs that we sing to. It can be our performance on how smooth the worship team le leads, on the quality of the sound or the video, whatever it is. 
Today, God's glory is not based on our perfection or performance. And if it is, we're simply veiling what God wants people to see. That's why, following the verses we just read, he says this, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. Why? He goes on, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, as the Lord and ourselves as your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, The light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Here's the eminence of the glory, not in what you do or try or veil, but the light shall shine out of the darkness. How? For the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Now listen to this, verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, jars of clay, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Today, God longs that you might be a vessel of glory. But to be a vessel that displays the glory comes from a glory beyond our ability, beyond our adequacy, that comes up from the heart. Today, if we are to promote any type of message, that would suggest that this church is about what we do for God and how much we sing to God or the number of times we pray to God. All we've done is veil the true glory and that veil can remain. As long as Our Christian walk is based on the do's and don'ts of Christianity. You must do this and this and that and this, but don't do this and don't do that and don't do this. Then Christ will be seen. No, I want to remind you, last Sunday, what did we see? That God never chose the morally perfect. In fact, he chose the bankrupt. He chose a generation of liars from Abraham, who lied several times about his wife to save his own backside because he thought he might die because of how beautiful she was. He passed that down because his son, Isaac, would then too lie about his wife only to find that he would have sons and yes, Jacob, a liar. Bankrupt. But God chose never to promote nor encourage the lie, but give mercy in light of the faith. God was willing to take broken people who believed, but not only believed, were willing to be transformed. Today, if we don't proclaim our transformation If we don't let people see our weakness, they'll never see God's greatness. If we try to put on perfume and create an aroma, we live in a world where they'll smell it and they'll see right through it. And today God is calling us to this incredible gift to be genuine. Genuine, that they might see genuine articles of those vessels that has received grace. That others might see the cracks and the breaks so that they too then might see the God who is the glue that holds it all together. Today as you go out your door You've been called as a people of purpose, a kingdom of priests. 
God knows that you are not perfect. In fact, God loved you in the midst of your sin and sent his son to die for you. But you were bought with a price. You are no longer your own. And today God desires to use you and shine his light into the darkness through you. But it will only happen when you're willing to allow people to see who you are so that they can see this incredible God who is filling a weak vessel. I pray that God would perhaps today put his finger on your heart in some of those areas where you have veiled the glory, whether to your family, and I think more than ever, I see my children have a front row seat to see my brokenness, to see my inability as a parent, to see my lack of patience. You know what I pray every day? I'm not perfect. Lord, I pray this, not that they would see a perfect father because they have that example in you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they'd see the ability of a holy God to transform a weak man. Today, are we allowing God to transform us, to wrestle with us? Or are we committed to our veils, trying to pretend or purport some image that the glory doesn't fade, that we've got it under control? Today, Are we trying to do for God what God is trying to do for us? By manipulating, by protecting. Today, God longs that he might be seen and will be seen as a light and aroma for Christ. And again, don't worry. For some, they're going to catch a whiff of that aroma and it will draw them in from life to life. And to others, when they see the aroma of Christ... It'll be a stench that will drive them away. That's the work of God. He deals with people's response to the aroma. He deals with what people do when they see the light shine. Your role is to be the lamp that shines brightly. Unveiled glory. The true glory. Because nothing we can do will ever match or compare And when people begin to see his glory, that's when they too will begin to see a life that can be changed and transformed. Today, if you've been caught trying to manipulate or make the fruit, hoping that one day you will be well rooted in God, stop. Because today, when you fix your roots in the right place, The fruit will be something that God makes. It's an automatic reproduction, a byproduct of being attached to the glory of God. Stop trying to achieve what God wants you to receive and look to him today for the wisdom in how to walk in this world that he might be your adequacy where he knows you're inadequate. And that's in our personal lives, in our corporate lives, as we live together as the body of Christ. I'm going to pray, and uh, we can just give these things to the Lord and trust that the Lord will do and take them and use them however he will. Lord, thank you. Thank you that this morning we can dive into your word and be challenged. Challenged by the fact that we so often, as Moses can attempt to veil your good glory. That we can take good things, yes, even a word which spoke of your character, your holiness, but it was never meant to be the source of life. It was meant to point them to the one that they needed. And when we reduce you to our efforts and ability to live up to a standard that we could never live up to, We purport a message that is about us and not you. 
Thank you that despite us, you are willing to shine a light and shine your glory in our lives to a watching world, that you use weak vessels for great heavenly things. And I pray today that as we come before you, that you would, again, remind us of these areas where we need to lift the veil. Allow people to see the glory fade so that they might turn to the one true glory. The difference between looking at the moon and the sun, the reflected versus the source. And may we settle for nothing less today than the source of light and life that you might produce for us and in us far greater than we could ever ask or imagine. We trust today that even despite us, you will, you will give off the aroma of Christ that you long to give off and that we will allow you not try to mask it or make it, but allow you to be and do what you desire to do. Thank you because you are a God who is faithful and is changing us, molding us, and shaping us today. If only we bow the knee and allow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Steve. That was a wonderful message. We just pray as we're going to sing this final song, Build My Life. That last bridge, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. We will not go unheard. We will sing with open arms, open hearts to you. So let's sing this all together.
In benediction, I'd like to read for you from Hebrews chapter one and the first few verses. It says this, Hebrews one and verse one. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I pray today that as you again go into your day and into the week ahead, that you would settle for nothing less than the glory that comes from the Son who is the representation of his very nature. You need never ask for anything more. You need never settle for anything less than the life of Jesus and the light of Christ. May he with you and use you this week to be an aroma everywhere he takes you as he leads you. God bless and have a great week.